Today's topic will be on intraoral autologous only block bone grafting for reconstruction of moderate to severe atrophic alveolar ridge. Part one will deal in mandibular atrophy reconstruction. So the challenge in mandibular atrophy is reconstruction of severe atrophy of the posterior mandible. And I would like to concentrate today on a severe atrophy of the posterior mandible. So let's take this picture as an example for severe atrophy of the posterior arch of the posterior mandible. And one can immediately see the deficiency, the bone deficiency in the posterior area. There is one implant left out of three implants. Two were already lost and the last one should be extracted as well. And how can you recognize the severe atrophy when you when you take the tongue aside, you see that the floor of the mouth in the same level that uh, you can see the crest of the arch. And this is a severe atrophy when you lost most of the alveolar bone, most of the available bone. Although the mandibular canal is situated about 7 to 8 millimeters inferior to the crest, to the alveolar crest, yet the inter-arch relationship are not favorable and the distance is too far. What are the surgical treatment options for such a condition? What do we have in our basket to treat surgically posterior atrophy, posterior severe atrophy of the mandibular area? So we can use one very easy and very convenient method, surgical method, which is the short implants. So when will be the indication for short implantation of the posterior arch? When we have acceptable inter-arch distance and acceptable it's for you to judge. And the second is sufficient bone superior to the neurovascular bundle, as can be seen in this demonstration. The second surgical options that is available to us is a buccal or lingual implant positioning. This is a new technique, new surgical technique of the new era when we can use a computer to aid us, to help us in the right positioning. And this is the only way to do this kind of operation via help of and via a navigation, computer navigation. So let's see the illustration as it's seen here. So the indication will be again sufficient bone width lateral or lingual to the neurovascular bundle as can be seen in this illustration and in this animation. And let's see a real case. This is a template prepared with the aid of computer uh, navigation and it might be accurate and very precise to enable to place implants on one side of the uh, neurovascular bundle. So this, we have this stiff and very precise uh, surgical template and this is the illustration of the pre-operative pre preparation in the computer. So three implants are to be placed on the buccal side, on the lateral side of the neurovascular bundle, as seen here in this illustration. And this is the actual post-operative three implants. Four, one implant is anteriorly uh, uh, at the premolar, at the first uh, lower right premolar, and three uh, implants are at the area of the first and second 
right lower molars. And those are the real positions according to the guidance of the um, surgical template prepared previously uh, according to the CT scan. So this is the prepared, the pre-prepared illustration at the computer of the three implants. On the one side you see the first implant, on the middle the second implant, and on the lateral side you see the last distal implant. And those are the real implants placed at time of operation at the same position, planned position, as uh, done by the surgical template via the guidance, the computerized guidance. So this is the only way to use this technique. And the indication, again, I repeat, the indication is when you have enough space, either lingually or laterally, to the bundle, along the bundle. Otherwise, you cannot use this technique at all. The third surgical option that we have to overcome an atrophy and severe atrophy of the posterior mandible for implant placement for, of course, for fixed uh, prosthesis is a buccal replant repositioning, sorry, the buccal repositioning of the inferior alveolar neovascular bundle. This is a very uh, known technique and actually I hardly use it today since there is a very, uh, again, the, limi the limitation is a nerve injury since we have to actually move the neurovascular bundle laterally as can be seen in this uh, animation prepared uh, by Dental Master for me. Destruction osteogenesis is a promising technique, yet in the posterior mandible, when we have a when we have severe atrophy, we have few limitations, and two limitations are very important. The first one, the destructed segment, since, since we are dealing in a very atrophic atrophy, may be uh, resorbed or fractured, and we have to control the trajectory of the destruction. And since we don't have teeth on the posterior area, it's very hard to control the trajectory of the, uh, of the destructed segment, and most of the time it moves medially during its movement upward, uh, and this is a limitation. And also there is a high, there, are, has, there is a high complication rate uh, in the posterior mandible. Although it's a promising technique and we use it quite a lot in the anterior maxilla and also for uh, other uh, reconstructions, uh, for the posterior very atrophic mandible, it still has some limitation. Another interesting surgical method, which is quite similar to the destruction osteogenesis, yet you do it in one operation, is the inlay bone graft. The inlay bone graft has another limitation since you need at least five millimeters of bone above the neurovascular bundle to enable you to move this segment upward superiorly to enable you to do the inlay grafting via autologous bone or uh, allograft or xenograft as illustrated here in this uh, animation. Of course, we can do guided bone regeneration, and we have several techniques with uh, reinforced membrane or with uh, titanium mesh, but again, we are talking about three-dimensional uh, bone reconstruction and a very severe atrophy which is quite uh, difficult and sometimes not predictable. But this is one case just to show you this is with titanium mesh you prepared your area your augmentation 
area with titanium mesh or with uh, reinforced membrane and then you fill it with bone substitute. I use most of the time bone substitute together with PRP covered with patients on plasma and this is the situation. On the one side you can see the CT cut five months after the operation and now it's easily can be done and implant. Yet it's not predictable as the next uh, surgical procedure. So the surgical procedures that I want to talk about, the benefits, the pros and cons, is only bone grafting. Autologous intraoral only bone grafting. I've done my first intraoral autogenous only bone grafting in 1997 and since then I have gained experience and now I can share with you some of this experience to uh, enable to gain a vertical dimension for atrophic mandible. And I've written a few publications on that subject and you can see here uh, about 11 uh, papers dealing in uh, this methods, results, uh, success, survival of implant and we'll go a little bit over the numbers and just uh, to mention a few numbers of success of this procedure. So what is only bone grafting procedure? And I'm talking intraoral only bone grafting procedure. So the first concept and it is different from, os uh, from destruction osteogenesis or inlay bone grafting. So this, the first leading concept is do not harm the patients. First, do not harm the patients. And when I am examining new procedure, new surgical procedure, I always think what will happen at time of failure what will, where, what will be the consequence when this operation will fail? And in case of only bone grafting, the same as in uh, guided bone regeneration, you are back to zero and not to minus. What we have in destruction osteogenesis or in inlay bone grafting, you lose this small segment that you have superior to the mandibular canal. That's why I hardly choose those uh, methods, surgical methods, and I prefer either guided bone regeneration or only bone grafting. So when we fail, well, when I fail, um, I get back to the same position that I've started with. So this important sentence, first, do not harm, is very important. So what is only bone grafting? Only bone grafting is harvesting bone from one area intraorally and we prefer the mandible, either the symphysis or the ramus or the retromolar area and we build step by step the area, the recipient area. So we have a donor site and the recipient site. The donor site, we harvest the bone and the recipient site is the area where we place the bone, when we uh, fix the bone. And the, the donor site is a monocortical if it's the area of the ramus, and we have corticocancellous monocortical and some cancellous bone if we harvest the bone from the symphysis. So here it's the example of a monocortical bone harvested from the right ramus to uh, cover a bone defect, a vertical bone defect, and we are dealing today only vertical bone defects and uh, uh, moderate to severe, but I want to show you mostly severe cases. This is a moderate case. So you can see the area of the recipient site, which is very close to the donor site. So it makes this operation a very small operation and one can make this operation uh, also in, gen in general anesthesia, sedation or local anesthesia. So I usually cover the area with a bone substitute, a slow resorbent bone substitute such as BIOS uh, mixed with 
uh, PRP and covered with PPP, patients on plasma, and the donor site is also refilled with bone substitutes, low resolvable bovine bone substitute and covered either with membrane as seen here or with patients on plasma, the PPP, platelets poor plasma. You can see the x-ray immediately after the operation and we wait six months, say five to six months and then uh, implantation is performed. So we examine the long-term follow-up on uh, dental implants placed in only bone graft. And this is yet not published data, this is final data. So we collected uh, patients from 1998 to 2010 and I examined both the success of the bone graft and the success of implantation done in bone graft area. And out of 250 patients, uh, 262 only bone grafts were performed. This is 1.04 uh, bone graft per patient because we have sometimes patients who need bone graft in both areas, on the right side and the left side, in the upper, in the lower. So that's why we have 1.04. And 727 implants were implanted into areas when autologous only bone grafting were performed. If we look at this pie uh, that uh, gives us, depict the areas of the bone graft performed, we can immediately see that we have almost half a maxilla, 52.3% compared to 47.7% done in the mandible. This is retrospective study and not prospective study. So 1998 till 2010. So in the mandible we can see in this pie uh, most of the bone graft were performed in the posterior area which is logical since we have uh, most of the teeth, uh, we lose most of the teeth at the posterior part before we lose the anterior teeth and that's what we, where we need uh, firstly implant and most of the time we need vertical or horizontal augmentation there. On the other hand, on the maxilla, the different, um, different areas need bo needed bone graft. We have about 30% in the anterior area, which is the aesthetic area, and we will deal in the maxilla on part two. So today, in part one, we look only at the posterior mandible area, uh, only bone grafting. Part two, next lecture, will be on the maxilla. So let's look at this posterior area of the mandible. So most of the cases, one layer is needed. So I'm harvesting a monocortical layer from a nearby area via um, piezo surgery or oscillating uh, so and then fix it with 1.6 millimeter self-tap titanium screw to the recipient area after I'm doing a decortication with a surgical round burr. And then I fill the gap between the blocks and the recipient site with uh, bovine bone particles with uh, uh, bios mixed with PRP and covered and also the donor site is filled as I said with this slow resolving bone substitute and then covered with uh, a resolvable membrane or better with patients on plasma the PPP. Five months later you can see here and appreciate the uh, healing of the area only five months after the surgery and now implants can be performed according and after of course a CT scan is uh, done. And this was done a few years ago and this is seven years later 
one can appreciate the bone and the stability of the bone that we get uh, via this uh, procedure. And if we look on that cut of this premolar and molar on this side of the screen, you can appreciate the amount of bone and the stability of the bone along these seven years of follow-up. And this is what we would like to get via this only bone graft surgical procedure for vertical augmentation at the posterior atrophic mandible. So, let's go back to the numbers. So, block survival, we found out in these uh, cases at the mandible, at the posterior mandibular area, 94.6% block survival and mean follow-up time was about four years. Success of dental implant. We published a 2007 at the Journal of Perio, and we found out the survival, the total survival rate was 97%, almost 97%. Yet, the five years cumulative survival rate was 88%. But if we look how many of the implants had more than 1.5 millimeter of resorption at the cervical area, we found out that only 5% of the implant had presented with bar marginal bone loss uh, equal or bigger than uh, or larger than 1.5 millimeter. So this is quite a good result and we are talking about only bone graft, vertical only bone graft. What would be the donor site. What would be the consideration? So we have the amount of bone that we need, if we need a lot of bone, or we have the area. So are we going to harvest bone from external sources? Do we really need, is it really necessary to go for external area, either the ilia crest, the calvaria, the tibia, or we can use only intraoral donor site? If we use only intraoral donor site, we have one limitation. It's a very important limitation. We have limited bone reservoir. We have limitation of the amount of bone that we can harvest for very big or large bone defects. So how we are going to overcome this limitation? A few years ago, I have published a, a paper in the uh, implant dentistry 2005 on the surgical success of intraoral autogenous block only bone grafting for alveolar regiogmentation. And in this publication, we examined the different areas in the intraoral sites of the mandibular sites that we can harvest bone for bone augmentation. So, what are those sites? So first is the mandibular symphysis, the retromolar area, and the mandibular ramus. Actually, if you have, uh, if you need a lot of bone for bone augmentation, if you have a big or huge defect, you can use all three of them at one operation. Uh, you can use the retromolar, the ramus, and the symphysis. But what would you have for first choice? So if you have a small defect, one can use a retromolar area, which can be seen here. You harvest the bone, it's quite a safe procedure, and then fill it with bone substitute covered either with bone, with a membrane, resolvable membrane, or with uh, patients on plasma, if you use PRP uh, and PPP or PRF, depends upon the technique you use. And this is a very easy operation, can be done under local anesthesia. The second area is a mandibular ramus. You can harvest more bone from them, and it's for the patients in, in local anesthesia, it's a little bit more difficult, but yet the operation mimic the cut, mimic the mucoperiostal uh, envelope, is 
like uh, extraction of wisdom, uh, impacted wisdom tooth. So one can see here the size and the amount of bone you can harvest. This is a monocortical bone. And if you are dealing in a posterior mandible, which is the topic of this lecture, this is a very convenient and easy area to harvest the bone. This is a neighboring area, the same anesthesia, the same injection, and you have the bone, you fix it in the recipient site, and it is done. And this is uh, just to show in a short video the uh, technique that I use. I do only three cuts, anterior, posterior, and a connection cut, and then I break the bone. And here I use uh, left side ramus to harvest the bone and then I, the recipient side is on the right side. At least two self-tap screw are used to fix the monocortical block and sometimes you need three if you don't get the stability. The stability of the block is crucial to success and also the contact area between the recipient site and the uh, block. And the mandibular symphysis would be the third choice for you. You can harvest more bone in the, in the mandibular symphysis, yet you get some numbness uh, and uh, might get small nerves injuries uh, sensation injuries to the lower uh, incisors, which most of the time gets better in few months. Here you have two ways to uh, make your flap, either intracircular or intravestibular. And this is an intracircular flap. One needs to identify both mental nerve. The cut is five millimeters anterior medially to the uh, opening of the mental nerves and three to four millimeters under the apices of the uh, canines and anterior uh, mandibular incisors lower incisors. So you can see an example of two blocks harvested from this symphysis. This is a decortication done with a surgical bear and this is a recipient site and then harvesting the bone either with a saw or a oscillating saw or reciprocating saw or piezoelectric surgery and then separate it with a small chisel. So when you do the cut, either with this oscillating or reciprocating saw or with the piezoelectric surgery, you have to cut through the cortex till you get to the cancellous bone and usually under the apices of the anterior lower mandibular teeth, I do it with a bevel of 45 degrees and the same is done on both sides to prevent any damage to the mental a nerve uh, and to the lower mandibular incisors. And this is an example of a mucoporiostal flap done through a vestibular cut. Again, one has to take care not to damage the both mental, for mental nerves. And if you are feel confident enough, you can even prepare the, uh, the osteotomies for the screws, for the 1.6 uh, self-tap screws at the area, because in the symphysis is so convenient to the operator, it is less convenient to the patient. As can be seen here in this uh, video. This is an intravestibular cut, and then cutting the bone with piezo surgery, through the cortex and you can prepare the blocks sometimes three, four, two blocks according to the size of the recipient defect and you can also make the holes and preparation for the screws. 
So let's go again to the numbers. If we'll examine the numbers uh, uh, that uh, were not published yet from 1998 to 2007, what were the donor sites that they used for posterior mandible uh, defect recovery uh, augmentation? So if we look at these two, uh, 262 only bone graft procedures, most of them were harvested from the ramus, 67%. And this is my first uh, choice. Uh, only 30% were harvested from the symphysis. And I think if we'll examine the next 10 years, it will be less symphysis and more ramuses. So with the time, I go more for the ramus and less for the symphysis. At the beginning of 2000, I used more symphysis. That's what we knew, that's what we did. But today we do more ramuses. So this will change with the years. And sometimes in huge defects, in a very uh, severe atrophy, I use both ramus and symphysis, but this is about only 4% of the cases. How much we can gain vertically through this procedure? So we published uh, 2005 a publication again in the implant dentistry and we found out if we examined the vertical addition from, measured from the bottom of the vertical deficiency before bone grafting to the top of the only bone graft five months later, we gain about mean, uh, mean vertical addition was 5.6 millimeters, which is quite a lot. But you have to take under consideration that this, these measurements were done from the bottom of the defect. And sometimes the defect has a U-shaped uh, defect or a V-shaped, and we put the bone on top of it. So when you examine the vertical dimension from bottom to top, you get the mean uh, 5.6. But most of the time, if you have a flat defect, you will gain about 3 to 5 millimeter as the most, according to the width of the cortical bone that you, ha you were harvesting. So it's not always that much. What will we do in cases that we have more than five millimeters vertical deficiency, as can be seen here. If we have only vertical dimension of uh, deficiency of three to five millimeter, then one layer, one tier is enough. But when we have m more than this, we need either to harvest bone from extra oral side or to do a different te surgical technique. So this is the first layer done for this uh, guy, that, uh, for this man, that has quite a severe def bone deficiency at the posterior area of the mandible. And it was done at the same technique. Bone were, was harvested from the symphysis area, and uh, we gained about five millimeter vertically, but still it was not enough, and we had to gain more. So when we have a severe defect, which is more than five millimeter vertical dimension, we have to use a different technique, either to use an extra oral source or to use a different surgical technique, as I will present now. The multi-tier only bone grafting. The multi-tier only bone grafting is a uh, technique that I published in 2007 and I would like to present to you now. So what is a multi-tier only bone grafting, which I also call the a synonym name, is the brick wall technique. The brick wall technique, as can be seen in this uh, animation, is a technique which the first layer is harvested, as you've seen before, from either from the ramus, as seen here in this illustration. And the second layer is harvested five months later to, to augment the same area on top on the first layer. So we do it like a brick wall, first layer, and then five months later, another layer. Actually, you can go 
layer by layer. And we can gain about a one centimeter, 10 millimeters of bone via this technique. And let's see a case of such technique. Again, I repeat, harvesting the first layer from ramus or symphysis, and then we, five months later, we do another layer on top of the first layer that were harvested from a different uh, donor site, a different intraoral donor site, either the uh, contralateral uh, 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 ramus or symphysis if we harvested the first time from the ramus. Let's see this case. So you may be familiar, if you are not that young dentist, you will be familiar with this old, not used anymore, we don't use this implant anymore, the blade, blade type, which were used very uh, widely in the 50s. So after 20 years, uh, this was, these two blades implant were infected and actually needed to be extracted. And this leaves quite a disaster at the area, as can see here. And you see the amount of bone resorption around those implants and the amount of granulation tissue around these implants. And when I took those implants out, it leaves the posterior site like two canoes uh, boat uh, almost no bone, but we have the outside quite safe, the out, the out layer, the cortical quite safe, but all the inside were infected almost to the uh, mandibular canal. And this was almost 10 years ago, a 2003. And a few months later, I did the first layer. This is a situation, the pre-op situation. It was done both to the right side of the mandible and to the left side, to both sides of the posterior side of the mandible. And this is the right side and the left side immediately after the mucoperiostal flap was performed. This is February 2004, almost 10 years ago. The first tier, the first layer, Bone was harvested from the right ramus to uh, augment the right area, as can be seen here. Three blocks were harvested. F I filled the donor side. I filled the gaps between the blocks and mixed it with PRP, covered with PPP, as I most of the time do. And then I covered the, the donor site with resorbable membrane. Look at this area in between the two blocks and we'll remember this area and we'll see it in five months, how it heals. And then this is the left side. And for the, the first tier of the left side, bone was harvested from the left ramus. So under general anesthesia, I harvested bone from both ramuses, the right to augment the right side and the left to augment the left neighboring area. Both where you, I used the uh, bone substitute to uh, fill the donor site and to close the gap between the blocks and the recipient site. And all this was done after preparation, decortication of the recipient site. So this is the left area and now it's covered with PRP and PPP. And we wait five months. This is immediately after the operation, one week after the operation, and we wait five months and now we do the second layer. And look at the area. This is the right side five months after the first layer was performed. And this is the facial view of the right side and the lingual view. And you remember I told you to, to keep in mind the area between these two blocks. And one can see here the wonderful incorporation and the wonderful bone healing almost with no bone loss at the right side. And look at the left side. This is the two blocks five months after the first layer. And now we are ready and one can see here at the area uh, the mental foramen just under the first anterior block. 
So for the second year, five months after the first year, bone was harvested from the symphysis area, as can be see he seen here, and is placed in second layer, second tier, on top of the first layer that was performed five months earlier. So this is a second tier, the right side and the left side. Covered with PRP and PPP as I always do and the donor site was filled and covered with resolvable membrane. This is how we started with and this is immediately after I extract, a few months after I extracted the two blades implant after the first tier and this is 10 months later, just prior to implantation. And this is already 10 months after the first operation, after five months after the second layer was performed. And this is the view, you can appreciate the amount of bone we gained through these two procedures. So implants were performed and one can see here the uh, still, uh, the, you can identified the bone substitute as a conglomerate in between the new bone that is the three-dimensionally augmented on this defect, vertic huge vertical defect of both sides only via intraoral bone augmentation. But yet we needed two operations. So three implants were placed on the right side and three implants were placed on the left side and you can see here the length of the implants and the position of the alveolar crest which, which is very favorable and we diminished and decreased the intermaxillary uh, deficiency. So eight years later, this is after eight years, this is a stable bone, a live, li live bone and the stability is what important. It's not like, it's not just a few months later, you need to examine the patients many years later. And this is eight years later, follow up at a very resistant bone. Can we make this operation a little bit more favorable to the patients? Since we need two operations under general anesthesia and Oh, and three donor sites. At the first operation, we had two donor sites, one on the right side of the ramus and on the, sec on the left side, and that's the second operation at the symphysis area. So in 2009, I published a technique at the Journal of Periodontology, a new technique which I called Symphysis Revisited clinical and histologic evaluation of newly formed bone and reharvesting potential of previously used symphysis donor site for only bone grafting and it means for vertical only bone grafting. It can be used also for horizontal of course but this case that I want to show you is the donor site revisited. What is donor site revisited? It's going back five months later, as seen here in this illustration, this animation done for me by Dental Master, to the same donor site. So the first layer is harvested from one donor site, and the second layer, five months later, is harvested again from the same donor site, in this case, the symphysis. As was as seen here in this animation. And then implants are placed 10 months later. So the benefits of this technique is you use the same donor site, although you use it twice, but you use it the same. Let's see a case. So this lady, this is the first layer harvested from, this is a donor site, the symphysis donor site. So the first layer was harvested and then filled as I use, this is of course different case, filled with a bone substitute cover with PPP. Patients on plasma, platelets poor plasma. And this is a situation, the donor site after five months. Do we really need to fill the gap, to f sorry, to fill the donor site? for second harvesting. Will it heal spontaneously without filling with bone? Is it really necessary? 
So we made this comparison. We compared a uh, field donor site, as can be seen in this X-ray, to unfilled donor site, as can be seen in this X-ray. And this was done in cooperation with Professor Ludovico Sbordone from Italy. And it was uh, published in 2011 in the Clinical Implant Dental Related Research, the Comparative Study of Symphysis Donor Defects Unfilled uh, compared to filled uh, with bone substitute. And what we have found out that the volume recovery after five months with f in, a f in the field defect were 97.7%. It wasn't 100%, but it was almost 100%. On the other hand, 18 months later, the unfilled defect had only 73% of filling the volume uh, the volume at the unfilled donor site. So we clearly want the donor defect to be filled almost 100%. So we always fill it. So this is to show how I harvest the bone five months after the first operation. This is the same work. I, I use uh, oscillating saw or piezo surgery and it is quite hard to harvest the bone only five months after. And this is just to show you how I did it to the same lady. And look at this symphysis. It, this is the bone you get after five months. And then I cut it for a few blocks. And then with a small chisel, I separate the blocks the same way that I do, that I did five months prior to this. So only five months and I can harvest bone from the same donor site to gain more volume to the recipient site, to gain another, to have another layer, another tier, uh, as I told you, the, uh, the technique that I use, a multi-tier technique. So I was curious to know what kind of bone, what kind of new bone I have, actually, that I use in this second layer. So I took a piece of bone, as you can see here from the, uh, from the one of the blocks and examined it under the microscope. And one can clearly see the remnant of the bio-os here, of the bone substitute. Yet, the amount of new bone is clearly seen here, that most of the field is new bone formation. This is a very live bone. And actually today, I even like this bone better than the first layer because we have new bone, young, a, a osteoid, we have osteocyte and osteoblasts all over. So the, the uh, process of bone healing and bone apposition is much better now because we have so much osteoblast, which are the cells that responsible for bone formation. And this is the most important thing, the osteoblasts, and we have a lot of it now in this young bone. So bone formation is much better now. So I prefer even this second layer. So this is a second layer, and we are at 10 months. We waited another five months, and implants are placed at both layers. The first layer was at five months, a second layer, and gain five months and then implant placements. And no damage, no harm was done to the uh, look and to the profile of the lady since also at the second time I filled the donor area. And let's see another case. This is the first operation. Bone is harvested from the symphysis and now we are at the second layer, five months later. Look at the bone here. It looks vital, although you can see here in this conglomerate the existence, yet the existence of the, uh, of the bone substitutes that were placed uh, five months prior to it. So I named this bone the bio bone block. New bone that I harvested, the new block that I harvested five months after the first block was harvested from the same donor site. 
So if you look back to the numbers, we had at the posterior mandible about 94 total uh, only bone grafts. And as we are talking about a retrospective study, one tier we had most of the cases, about 90%, 87.3% were just one layer. And only at the almost 13%, I did uh, two layers, and yet only six, uh, or only half of them were uh, the bio bond lock, the revisited technique. But today, we are talking about 1990 to 2010, this data was collected. Today, I used more and more uh, the technique of revisiting uh, the same donor site. Now, I told you that my first choice for donor site is the ramus. Is it also feasible for the ramus to harvest twice from the same donor site? So it is. So let's look at the case of a revisited donor site, the ramus. And we go back to the first case that I just showed you when we had this challenge of severe atrophy of the posterior mandible. It's a case where the lady lost already a few implants on the posterior area and the last implant is to be lost as well. So at the first operation, one bone was harvested from the ramus after a preparation of the recipient site with a round bear as I showed you, decortication. You first prepare the recipient site and then bone is harvested from the ramus, the same way that I showed you two cuts and then longitudinal cut, connecting them, and with a chisel, I break it. I do not do a cut in the inferior border. And then I fill both the donor and recipient site with bone substitute mixed with PRP covered with patient-owned plasma, platelets, poor plasma, which is treated with human thrombine. And this is already five months later. And this is the situation after mucoperiostal graft. This is the area uh, of the graft five months after the first operation. So bone is harvested again from the same area as can be seen in this uh, video. This is the same donor site five months after the first operation. With the same technique, this time with piezo surgery, I cut, two cut the anterior and posterior and connecting a longitudinal cut. And then I use a small chisel to break a monocortical piece and I do not do an inferior border cut. And then I took a piece to look at the donor site area. And one can see here the remnant of the uh, bios here and the amount of new bone and the amount of osteoblast around this new bone formation. So this is an histological view from the donor site five months after filling with bone substitute and PRP and covered with PPP. So the same was performed. The second layer uh, was performed with this bone and one can see here one complication that is quite often happened that the head of screw, screw is broken and I just leave it to the time of uh, implantation and then with a small trephine I take this, uh, this screw. So the same technique I use a bone substitute with PRP and PPP and this is already 10 months after the third operation, five months after the second operation. And now let's examine the CT. 10 months after the first operation and five months after the second tier. Both tiers were harvested from the same donor site from the left ramus. So let's make few cuts and examine first the donor site. 
So this is the view of the donor site 10 months after the first operation. So you see it at time zero, at the five months after the first harvesting and five months after the second harvesting. Although we lost the shape, the natural shape of the ramus at that area, you can appreciate the bone that was actually harvested for the second layer. And the last uh, view is just the time of implant placement. But actually, if I needed another layer, I could harvest another layer, even 10 months later. So from the same area, from the same small donor site at the Ramos, I could harvest, I can harvest again and again, a few months after the first operation, if I need a lot amount. And this is how we overcome the limitation of the amount of bone we can harvest from a single donor site at the mandibular, uh, as a, at the mandibular area. So let's see now the premolar area. And this is very easy to examine since we have the mental foramen. So we compare the uh, pre-op situation. You can see the implant that were extracted as well. And this is after the first tier. And one can examine already the amount of bone gained in one operation. And this is after the second tier. Look at the amount of bone. Anyone, anyone can make an implant here. This is an easy procedure now. We got a very nice shape of bone. Let's see the first molar area. This is a situation, the pre-op situation. And this is five months later after the first tier was performed. And this is 10 months later, just the time of implant placement, after five months after the second tier. And look, you can still see the layers, the original bone and, and compact bone, and then the first layer and the second layer. And this is just the molar area. Let's go to the second molar area because I plan here three implants, one at the premolar, second premolar, and two at the first molar and second left molar, mandibular molar. Let's examine, this is a pre-op, this is five months later after first tier was performed, and this is after 10 months, a time of implant placement, uh, five months after second tier. Again, you can recognize the layers here. So as you can see this here, this is the uh, pre-op situation at the donor site and this, those three areas of planned implantation at the premolar, first molar and second molar. This is after the first tier, the donor site and three uh, planned implanted area. And this is after the uh, second tier. So just from this, few centimeters of donor site, we can gain so much bone just by this technique of harvesting from the same donor site. But one can need to remember and to fill the donor site with bone substitute. So this is a situation at time of implant placement and then I extract, I, I extracted the broken screw, screw uh, with the tr small uh, trefine drill, as can be seen here. And three implants are placed. And also I took a biopsy at the distal area to see what is a bone that I have there, here. Because there are two layers there. One that was done five months prior to implantation and one that was done 10 months prior. And if we take a closer look, look at the amount of new bone formation at the area. And even a closer look, look at the bone here. You can hardly recognize any bone substitute left in this area although it's a biobone block. All is built with new bone formation and bone substitute. Let's see another case, just briefing, to see another uh, uh, histology from the same technique. Again and again, I'm getting the same, uh, the same situation 
new bone formation and wonderful uh, bone at the area through this technique. And this is already a time of exposure. And if we draw an imaginary line, this is, was the original uh, line, the first tier and the second tier. And one has to take care at time of uh, rehabilitation to prevent a premature contact. This is extremely important since this bone is a very delicate and sensitive bone to premature contact. So it's very important to do a very accurate prosthesis. Before we get to the end of this lecture, of part one of mandibular bone deficiency at the posterior area and, and uh, augmentation via autologous bone graft, I would like to go over implant failure. We don't have only success. So we have to go over implant failure as well. So if we look on the data that will be published soon, I hope, from 1998 to 2010, on the long-term follow-up of dental implants placed in only bone graft. The mean follow-up time is 4.1 years. On the mandible, because we examine today only the mandible, 30, 330 implants totally were placed in a grafted bone, and survival we had 93% of the implant. But if we look at those 23 implants that we lost, which is 6.97%, uh, uh, about 7%, most of the failures, 82.6% of the failures were post-prosthetic failures and not during surgery, not immediately after surgery. And this is extremely important since Although the bone is very good, as I showed you, although we have so many osteoblasts and new bone formation, yet the area had so many operations done, first losing the teeth and then sometimes losing implants there, and then first operation augmentation procedure and secondary operation and then implant placement and then implants exposure, it, about five to seven operations on the same area. So the soft tissue is not so good anymore. It's a scar tissue. So when you do the prosthesis, one has to take care not to cause um, any pressure on the soft tissue to prevent uh, an ischemia of the tissues. So let's examine a case uh, of such a case that we had failure, and this is really a painful one. So uh, now you can see the pre-op situation. It's obvious that we had lost those teeth here, and we had lost a lot of bones. So the first thing is to prevent such a situation, to extract the tooth before we get such a resorption. But anyway, this was a pre-op situation, extraction, a waiting period, and now you can see the situation at time of the augmentation procedure. Three blocks were performed here, as can seen here, and this is a situation five months later. Let's take a closer look. Look at the blood vessels here. But actually, each time I raise the mucoperiosteal flap, I disconnect the periosteum from the new bone. And it has to build itself from beginning. So this is a time of implant placement. Only one layer was performed. Four implants were placed. And this was a very viable bone. And then after a few months, the uncovering procedure was performed and bridge board was done by a prosthodontist. I do only the surgery and prosthodontists do the prosthetic work. Shortly after, this is only two years later, we started to lose the bone there. 
And when I did an exploratory operation, I've just seen most of the anterior implant, the mesial implant, uh, was already lost its uh, bone, so I took it out. And then implant by implant, it was like fire, and I lost three out of the four implants in few months. But one has to take under consideration when this process starts of a bone loss, you have to take the implant very fast to prevent more bone loss because the implant is less important. What really important is the bone and we don't want to lose the bone. So I took all three of implants out and then I redid the vertical bone augmentation, a new layer, and with the same procedure covered with PRP and PPP. And few months later, three new implants were done. And this is already four years later. This is a stable situation, and hopefully it will stay there for a long time. So this was the first part on reconstruction of severe atrophy of the posterior mandible. The second part will be reconstruction of the maxilla, atrophic maxilla. Thank you very much.